Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip was shot back in April of 2019. Originally, this show was named Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage and was intended only to be seen here in Nashville on the local CBS affiliate Channel 5. We're under a 30-minute time schedule, so we had to edit part of the show out. This part's never been seen. I called up my good friend Garth Brooks, and before we'd ever done one show, he agreed to do this for me. This clip that we took out, he talks about his mother, his kids, uh, being in the band, what it was like being on the road, seven guys in a seven-seat van. It's very insightful, and all the way up to becoming what he is today, a superstar that he's become. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, my good friend, Garth Brooks. You know how much I love my mom. Mm -hmm. My mom was a singer, but my mom had serious problems with a thing called empty nest syndrome. Mm. I was the last of six kids, so me and my closest brother, Kelly, in age, we watched it start to come unravel. And when Kelly went to college, it was just me at the house and you know, I got to witness my mom just kind of coming apart at the seams. So she fought that. It was another, she would fight that for the next decade. Miss Sherwood, I think, started to see it happening to me when Taylor left and then August left. And it was just poor Allie at the house who, who hey, you want to hang out? And poor Allie, you know, she, she didn't have a chance. I was, I was all over her like a cheap suit just to be around her. <laughs> and uh, Trisha, it was Trisha that said, did you ever think about going on tour again? And the answer was, well, hell, I would, but would anybody else? Mm -hmm. And then when Chicago, the opening city, did what it did, when it set the American record for, for concert tickets sold, that was a pretty neat little welcome back. Mm -hmm. But like all things new, things are fun while they're new. And so I was scared to death. Atlanta was the next city. Um, I'm trying to think it was... Uh, Jacksonville was the next city after that. Well, Atlanta showed up and just melted the whole system. Well, that made you feel good too. And then Jacksonville is a guaranteed good time. I think we did five or six nights there. And it's like, okay, I think we're up and running again. So uh, for three years, we got to go out and I'm telling you, you saw the people yeah. that come to our shows, mm -hmm. they take it very personal. Mm -hmm. They do. They take a show very personal, no matter if they're in the very back. I remember one of the things I remember most about Nashville, ending the tour here, was a guy had a sign in the way back, and it felt like me and him were just talking to each other. We did two or three things back and forth to each other. The crowd kind of got real quiet so this guy and I could have the moment. His request, played it for him, looked at him, and it was like we were this far apart, and he was in the very back. And that is the crowd that comes sees the Garth Brooks show. Mm -hmm. And that makes me the luckiest person on the, on the face of the earth. Well, I think it's a, I think the door swings both ways. I think you know, they, they feel the same way, if not more Boy, so. That would be nice. So in that, you speak, Allie, she's singing, right? Mm -hmm. So the youngest one's bit with a bug. She's out just putting in her time, man, traveling. And she called me the other day, she goes, Dad, I'm sick of the dog. I said, you got a show tonight? She goes, yeah. I said, you'll get there. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get there. You know, Springsteen said it so eloquently. He said, that walk from the dressing room to the stage solves and cures everything. Mm -hmm. And it does, man. As you start walking there, all of a sudden your feet don't hurt. You start to step up right, set up right. <clears throat> that thing you had in your throat's gone. You hear that crowd come up, those lights, boom, and you're in it. And then all of a sudden time just disappears. What used to be a minute is now a second. And it's just flying, but at, at any time, when your game is on, you can stop it. Find that person, see those veins in their neck. Had a great time, look at them and point to them before they point to you. When that shit starts happening, that's when you're going, thank you God, this is what, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, I hope, because it sure is fun, it's easy, and uh, it's, um, it's neat to get to be the guy. So you got three, three years of of huge stadium concerts oh. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's funny because when I think about these faces that are traveling with us, when you talk about studio musicians and you talk about road musicians, the road musician, we picked five of the basic seven people 
were the five we took off with. So let's we'll start with the drummer, Mike Palmer, since day one. Palmer noted in the anthology, which I totally forgot, we set up to rehearse the first night or the first two nights, never played a note. All I want to do is just see how we got along. How we joked, who was with who kind of thing. See, because that playing part's two hours of the day. Mm -hmm. The other 22 hours, especially when you're in a van, no bus. We had seven pickers in a seven passenger van with all our gear. And we went from Kansas City to Florida to uh, um, New York. I mean, we were, we were all over the place. And uh, so you better figure out how much you love each other. So Palmer, drummer, uh, original member, Ty England is now back, college roommate, acoustic guitar player. Uh, Steel, Steve McClure, the original Steel player. Um, Dave Gant, the original band leader, piano. Mark Greenwood, bass player, who was original crew member. And when Betsy left to, ch to chase her solo career, Mark Greenwood stepped in on bass. So you're looking at five guys right there that you look around and go, okay, this is it. And you talk about your crew, you got the original sound guy, the very first guy you ever hired. The guy that's running the whole match, production guy, he was a bartender in college. Um, the guy running the lighting rig is the original lighting guy. The guy running the stage is the original stage guy. So it's good to have this family with you and very important. And I don't think we take, let's say our career is 10 yards long, I don't think we get a yard without the guys that brought you there. Did not Gordon sign with yeah, you? Yeah, Gordon's coming out with and us. What, it, he's going to, what, rhythm or something? Yeah, no, he plays electric lead, of course, because oh, okay. nobody's going <laughs> nobody's to outplay Gordon. Yeah. Uh, we also took uh, Blair with us, mm -hmm. which uh, I really like because Gordon and Blair have been playing on our records for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to have the studio feeling guys that do the live really well come out and, uh, and get it done. I already had to have a talk with Gordon, though, and this is exactly what we were talking about. Though you played on the records, these guys want to hear it with a little hair on it. And Gordon's a big, um, Gordon's huge on tone, texture, yes. all that stuff. Yeah. But what I need him to do is just, uh, I need him to forego a little uh, taste, give me a little more cheese. We talk about that word a lot, cheese. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's really good. And then of course, when you talk about 20 feet from stardom, you've got you know, Vicki Hampton and Robert Bailey two of the most noted background vocalists ever who are unbelievable vocalists on their own, but it's very sweet that they, that they lend me their voices that make mine sound better uh, to the audience. So it's a, it's a sweet gift that they bring. And then of course, you're out there always with the, the ace in the hole, Miss Yearwood, mm -hmm. with you the whole time as the love of your life and also, oh, you really want to get your ass kicked? Let me sick you on. Let me sick this woman on you. And uh, she had her. We were in St. Louis Stadium show, and she had a tailgate out front that just got rained out, horribly rained out. But thank God the stadium was indoor for us. So I told the people that night, "How many people were here for Trisha's tailgate that got rained out?" Oh, you know, everybody goes up. I said, "Yeah, I can't imagine expecting to see that woman and not see her." So, ladies and gentlemen, before I could even get it out, man, boom! They got louder. Than they did all night, which didn't set well with me, but they got louder than they did all night. She came out, kicked ass. It was a great thing to see happen. And then uh, went, so always having that woman uh, as a possible threat or as a possible uh, weapon, when you go out to do war with those people, that's a, that's a good ace in the hole right there. One of the, my heroes' bands growing up I, was Chicago. Yes. And it still is, I love Chicago. I, I wanted to be Terry Kath of Chicago, which was never, ever going to even come close to happening. <laughs> and when I got to Nashville, I realized that I was not the guitar player that I thought I was. I better learn how to write a song or something in country at that. And so James lives here, and James Panko, the founder of trombone player, lives here now. And so we did an interview with James where you're sitting, and he was real, I mean, extremely honest and, and, and he said, you know, as much as people see this and think how great it is to, right. which it is, but don't think that there's not a cost for doing this. And he goes, you know, I've missed a lot of birthdays. I Amen. missed a lot of graduations. And he says, now I've learned and at this stage of my life, 
you know, I've got somebody that can fill in for me when there's a graduation or right. and you got you got nobody to fill in with for you. <laughs> but you but you know you were there though for those moments. Heck know? yeah. So so one, you're the boss. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're the boss of your life. Uh, no matter where you're at in your life. So bust your neck uh, to do all that stuff that you can. So well, the great thing about just walking away from it and retiring was I never had to schedule around it anymore. Never miss nothing. But in that whole time, I'm sitting there going, how great would it be for our guys not to miss anything? So when we started touring again, 2014, we still had some guys that had kids that were 10 years old on up through their teenage years. So we started the 12th man program, that's what we called it. So we had a backup guy for everything. And the two of those backup guys are the hardest working women I've ever seen in my life. So we had it totally protected. Nobody missed anything. And if they did, they missed it because of their own choice. But it wasn't going to be because we were busy that they didn't get there. So I enjoyed it. We had a, I had a, one of the background singers, Karen Rochelle. I, I pulled her aside and made an example out of her to everybody. She said, hey, look, I know we got this show in Charlotte, but my first year anniversary is coming up. My husband wants to go to the beach. I said, honey, go. Go. I'll fly you there and fly you back so you only miss one show. But go because you're never going to get these days back. And it was cool. And it, it, uh, these guys took advantage of that, which they should. And thank God and the people, they've allowed us the freedom and the, the wealth, of, for lack of a better word, to get to make those decisions and hire other people to come in and set in for for a night. How great is that? It's lucky. That's the first time I've ever even heard of that being done, other than when James told me that. I, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know they talk about they talk about how hard this life is. Some people do, and it never has been for me because it's always been my joy to do what I did. Now let's talk about the the guiding principles. Um, one, I've been married twice. First time, I wasn't a very good husband because you're just gone all the time, right? And when those kids started coming, you knew your mom and dad was there. Every time you turned around, you were gonna to need to be there for them. So I promised Taylor I'd retire when she was six. She was a little baby and I promised her. I missed it by two years. I retired when she was eight. And uh, I never will ever regret any choice there. That was, that was fabulous.